Alright, I'm starting today off with a question. Why didn't I pull something out of my ever-shrinking list of jokes to make a fun little title for this video? I mock ships, I mock their captains, I mock their passengers, but this one... Well, I didn't need to. I don't need a special title for this video. I know that when we're talking about iconic vessels, we more often than not discuss the ones that actually sank. And although those are influential and interesting in their own ways, they rarely left an actual impact on history. However, when discussing vessels that gained true fame, from the war zone of World War II to the polluted Hudson River, the Queen Mary shone like a diamond across the world. And although she was at the end of an era of great ocean liners, she was certainly one hell of a way to go out. I tend to get sidetracked and I'm not great at transitions, so I'm gonna jump the gun a bit. After the Queen Mary's planning session, she underwent early construction in late 1930. As White Star was planning its Oceanic 3 and Germany was rocking the SS Bremen, Cunard had to play a game of catch-up. To add insult to injury, France and Italy were now planning their own superliners, and they were going to be sensational. Cunard could stand to lose to a worthy foe such as White Star or North German Lloyd, but the Italians? Unacceptable. Although very clearly a Cunard ship, Queen Mary was actually part White Star liner. Following the Great Depression, the British government would only provide funds to Cunard Line and White Star if they fused, forming this monstrosity of a logo in the process. Cunard White Star was born with Cunard holding a 62% share of the joint company. With a Cunard majority, the company determined their first act would be selling and scrapping a bunch of aging ships, mostly White Star liners. This was the dark ages for the ocean liner community. Scrapping of the Olympic, scrapping of the Adriatic, scrapping of the Baltic, and those are just the ones I've covered before. To be fair, some Cunard legends were scrapped as well, such as the Mauritania. Now, could the Queen Mary ever possibly rival the likes of such fabled and renowned ships? Surprise, surprise! Yes. The construction was kept very much under wraps, and back then, Queen Mary was only known as Hull 534. Secrecy about newly constructed ships was becoming a new custom of the era, as in the past, companies would go out of their way to build hype around new vessels. Construction was slow. The Depression was still in full swing, and it proved to greatly affect the financial stability of Cunard Line. As previously stated, Cunard wouldn't be able to get a loan out without the White Star merger, putting both of them in a kind of awkward spot. White Star's Oceanic 3 was eventually just split into two smaller ships, and they too were down on their luck. The Cunard White Star merger had everyone very hopeful for the future, especially now that they could go ahead with the completion of Hull 534. Now there's one question that was still yet to be answered. Now that Cunard White Star is a joint business, what naming convention would they use for their ships? I know, you were asking the exact same question. The Cunard naming convention was ending ships with the suffix IA like the Berengaria, Carmania, or Lusitania. White Star Line's custom was ending ships with the suffix IC, like the Homeric, Teutonic, or Pitts, Berg. Well, why don't we just compromise, says Cunard Line. Let's call her Victoria with my naming convention, and you can go play with your dinky little bath toys while the big boys talk. One custom of the era was to go to the standing king or queen to ask his or her permission to name the ship a certain thing. So, historians aren't exactly certain if this next thing happened or not, but legend says that when the Cunard guys went to King George V to ask his permission to name Hull 534 after quote-unquote the greatest queen of England, the king, unaware that they were talking about Queen Victoria, said, that's a great idea, my wife will be thrilled. Now, I don't know if this conversation really happened, but it's on the website. RMS Queen Mary it is, specifically named after Queen Mary of Tech. Construction continued through the early 30s, and she launched on September 26, 1934. The Queen Mary boasted 24 Yarrow-type boilers, which were arranged into groups of six, which were divided into four boiler rooms, with four Parson turbines and two separate engine rooms. This was powerful, to say the least, and came in at 32.84 knots on her sea trials. For context, the RMS clickbait was running about 22 knots when she hit the iceberg, and the SS Normandy, chief rival of the Queen Mary, peaked at 32.13 knots on her sea trials. The British once again held the fastest ship in the world, and for White Star, it was the first time they would win the Blue Ribbon in 44 years, the last time winning it with RMS Teutonic in the 1890s, the Blue Ribbon being an intangible award for the fastest Atlantic crossing, although I did discover that an actual trophy exists for westbound crossing. Weird. The RMS Queen Mary ended up with 80,774 gross registered tons, and she totaled in at 1,019 feet long with an 118-foot beam. She could accommodate 2,139 passengers in total, which comparatively doesn't seem like much given her size, but her three classes were all given excellent accommodations which took up quite a bit of space. 
She also had 1,101 crew members on board, which all needed space for themselves too. Compared to the SS Normandy, she was slightly faster, but not larger. The winter preceding Queen Mary's maiden voyage saw Normandy undergo a refit that pushed her just beyond 83,000 gross registered tons. Petty. Just petty. Queen Mary has 24 lifeboats held up by a series of gravity davits, a style getting pretty popular in the era. She boasts two masts, not visible on my model, and curiously has a streamlined bow, which would prove slower than Normandy's clipper bow. Despite this, she claimed the blue ribbon from the Normandy in 1936, lost it in 1937, and then took it back once and for all in 1938. She would hold it until the SS United States would steal it in 1952, and the SS United States still holds it to this day. Now have you ever looked at intricate European architecture and thought, hmm, if only it were a little more dull and tasteless? Introducing Art Deco. Sure, beautiful in some ways, but a step down for me personally. It certainly fit Queen Mary's personality as a ship and became very characteristic of her interior. Art Deco is the mother of modern architecture, the father most likely being Satan. Yeah, I'm opinionated, but you clicked on the video. Queen Mary's interior was actually considered a backward step by the industry, because Normandy was ultra-modern with very minimalist stylings. Yeah, folks, this is why I don't want to cover the Normandy. Queen Mary, by comparison, had a very unique and detailed style. Cunard Whitestar opted with the mindset of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Unfortunately, this mindset didn't catch on, and now we're stuck with buildings like this. Wood from all over the Empire was used to outfit Queen Mary's interior, taking advantage of Britain's expansive resources to create a diverse atmosphere on her interior. One of the more notable points of interest on the Queen Mary is the cabin-class dining saloon. Oh, you thought Lusitania was cool with two stories? Try three, buster. The room also had a huge map of the Northern Atlantic with Queen Mary's summer and winter routes detailed. And back when she actually did crossings, there was a little model of the ship that tracked her progress across the map. Even her tourist class lounge, the hangout for the lowest class on board, still boasted intricate colorings and far better accommodations than vessels had just 20 years earlier. In addition to a Christian chapel, Queen Mary was outfitted with a Jewish prayer room. She also had two swimming pools and some other cool stuff. Alrighty then, here we go. In August of 1939, Queen Mary was en route to Southampton when they got word that there were some diplomatic problems going on with the Germans with militarism stuff. She was escorted home by the HMS Hood. Queen Mary left Britain on September 1st for her next voyage to New York and soon got intel that some idiot had decided to declare war on the... planet. She was given blackout orders and told to run a zigzag pattern to avoid German U-boats. The ship was rushed to New York where she was soon joined by the Normandy. They sat awaiting their fate in a neutral port, knowing they were safe, but not for long. Soon in 1940, the Queen Elizabeth joined them too. They were useless sitting there for months. Ultimately, these ships were more useful doing what they were designed for. Transport. They decided to convert the Queen Mary, Normandy, and Queen Elizabeth into troop transport ships for the war effort. The Cunard Queens were sent to Australia, and the iconic Cunard funnels were painted navy grey, as were the hulls, and they fixed a long degaussing coil around their hulls which was designed to do something scientific relating to magnetics. I'm here to talk about ships, not science. I'm not gonna get into it. Because she was made by the French, Normandy had a mishap and was destroyed during conversion, meaning Cunard now easily had the best ocean liners on the seas. The Queen Mary's interiors were removed where possible during conversion and had the dining saloon covered in leather. In their place were thousands of bunks to cram over 15,000 soldiers on board. The HMTS Olympic, one of the most notable transport ships of World War I, was capable of carrying around 6,000, and that was considered impressive pathetic. Queen Mary also carried Winston Churchill numerous times on diplomatic trips, hiding him under the name Colonel Warden. Churchill even said Queen Mary was responsible for shortening the war by a year, metaphorically. World War II was a party with some voyages clocking in at over 16,000 soldiers on board. And on one voyage, she was hit with an enormous 23-meter rogue wave that caused her to list 52 degrees, only 3 degrees from capsizing. The only consequences were a little chip paint and a terrified group of passengers. What's worse is those poor passengers were on their way to England. Ugh. Post-war, she made her fastest crossing yet, at 3 days, 22 hours, and 42 minutes, which is crazy. She was refitted for passenger service in late 1946, adding air conditioning and a cinema. I also have got to mention that her new class system went from cabin, tourist, and third to first cabin and tourist. Okay? Okay. In 1947, Cunard White Star changed their name just back to Cunard and thus formally ended the White Star Line's era in the history books. In 1949, the Queen Mary ran aground in France. France just can't help but get in the way, huh? She was refloated within a day. 
The 1950s was the golden age of the Cunard Queens, with great speed and thousands of serviced passengers and incredible profits for Great Britain. The Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth ended up becoming the most profitable ships in the history of the North Atlantic. The late 50s, however, brought something darker for the vessels, a product of the time that would bring great suffering to sailors everywhere. The introduction of the jet age was a death sentence for the ocean liner industry. The boat people collectively despise this little piece of history and view it as the beginning of the end for the golden age of ocean liners as a whole. Cunard Line ships were losing passengers rapidly, and some voyages saw more crew members than passengers. This was not sustainable, and in order to fund the construction of the Queen Elizabeth II, Cunard began selling off some of their fleet. Also, Frank Sinatra shot a movie on board the Queen Mary around this time. I was looking for somewhere to throw that in, but didn't have much luck, so there you go. On September 27, 1967, Queen Mary held her 1,000th and final voyage. Suck it, Bruce Ismay, that's 1,000 more voyages than the Titanic ever completed. Queen Mary had carried over 2 million passengers, and on this final trip she was headed to Long Beach, California. The Queen Elizabeth II was to take her place. Queen Mary was converted into a hotel over the next few years with most of her machinery gutted, and she was cleared out from our deck down. A restaurant called Lord Nelson's and Lady Hamilton's was added here later done in the style of 19th century sailing ships. The drawing room, library, lecture room, and music studio were stripped of their interiors for commercial use. Long carpets were added along the corridors around passenger cabins, the same that hotels have to keep it quiet. Two shopping malls were built on the sun deck in areas that used to be first-class cabins, and the cinema was removed for kitchen space for new restaurants. The cabin-class smoking room was made into a wedding chapel and office space. Stuff like this makes me think that although I'm happy to see the ship preserved, she seems to have lost a good chunk of her elegance. Today she's traded owners a few times, but what I found most interesting was that the Spruce Goose was parked right next to her as another attraction for the city. Now you may have heard that Queen Mary has been in the news recently, and unfortunately the ship is run down with age, and may require over $23 million for upkeep, and the city of Long Beach is trying to look for alternative options. But for a second, forget that Queen Mary became. Recall what she was, a symbol of unprecedented glamour and elegance that radiated beauty and hope in a pretty uncertain time. She was one of the last great liners, and honestly, I'm sort of okay with that. I'd rather a ship like her and the SS United States to be the end of the era than a clunky dumpster fire like the Great Eastern. They went out on a high note, and what an incredible high note to go out on. So what did we learn? Beauty may be in the eye of the beholder, but modern architecture will always be garbage. So, I have a Twitter now. Uh, at Nautical Study. Neat stuff.